To Spine Crackers, the official uh, 47th ranked book podcast in Sweden. And that's official today. Take it to the bank. That's right. Yay. Every rung, 47 more rungs in that ladder before we've conquered Sweden. Top 50, baby. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Shout outs to all our Swedish listeners. We fucking love you. Yeah. Talk, talk, I think. <laughs> I, I don't know. Talk, talk. Welcome, everybody. Talk, talk. Greetings. Um, I'm my name is Gabe. I'm one of the hosts of the show Spine Crackers. Uh, I'm Matthew. I'm one of also the hosts of the show Spine Crackers. <laughs> I am I am Paul. I am also one of the hosts of the show Spine Crackers. We love it. We love <laughs> and together, hosts and we love what's happening. And together we can prize <laughs> Spine Crackers. <laughs> <laughs> The show you're currently listening to, <laughs> especially a if you're in Sweden, form. most likely. Oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, a long form book review podcast. Yeah, in deep dives, baby. That's what we, mm. you know, sit. We yeah. sit with it. We like to sit with it for a little while. That's right. Because we're uh, deep thinkers. Today, Gabriel, kick us off. This is yeah, your pick. Uh, yeah. So today we're reading um, to the friend who did not save my life by uh, Hervé or uh, Guibert. Uh, nice, nice. Uh, all our French listeners, uh, that, uh probably that was better than the rehearsals, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this is, was my pick, um, and therefore I've got to talk about it a little bit and introduce it. Um, it's, I, I, you know, I don't really have a good reason as to why I picked this book, I kind of stumbled upon it uh sort of randomly and the title grabbed me and i was like that sounds kind of cool and i looked into it and it turns out that it has some interesting kind of uh historical and philosophical connections with stuff that i have independent interests in like the first the first half of the book is uh basically a sort of uh semi-historical fiction recounting of the death of philosopher Michel Foucault, who uh, Guibert was uh, close friends with in real life and also in the book. Uh, the most, the most thinly veiled. Yeah. Except yeah. They, like, so it's just, it's just, he changes his name and then I don't just, even, which is like exact <laughs> all bi biographical information like that could be yeah. instantly just said. Yeah, I don't even know why he bothered to change the name because it's like so obviously, maybe that's something we should talk about because it's such an, you know, the, the, the lines between fiction and like, uh, and biography and autobiography in this book are like sort of non-existent. Yeah. In fact, it, it feels strange that it would even, maybe there was like a different set of circumstances at the time of writing and publishing, but like, man, I get in 2021, you know what I mean? It's just like, why, it's why even, well, also why even change the names of these people? You know, right. it's like, I get sensitivity and wanting to and whatnot, but like, yeah, I don't know if for yeah. such a ruthless self accounting of an experience that is so clearly singularly tied to this author. Yeah. Everyone at the time, I don't know. The, the other thing is weird is that this person who is now relatively unknown, I would say, uh, I had never heard of him before stumbling upon this book. Seemed like kind of the toast of the town uh, based on his sort of like social circles in the, in the book itself. Yeah. So yeah. And it's not like, as far as I know, it's not like Foucault or anybody like was needed to be protected 
socially. Like, I think he was gay and pretty out there and people knew it. And he was already dead by the time this book came out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I'm not, I'm not, it, it's sort of interesting <sighs> to think about why he, the book's not entirely about Foucault, by the way, but um, it's a chunk it, of it. it. It's a big chunk in the first half specifically. Maybe, maybe it, the names were changed because it was, it was published posthumously and maybe the publishers had more of an issue with it than he did. Maybe, you know, but they feel like, um, alternative names well this no this wasn't published posthumously this was published yeah. in 1990 and he died in 91 or 92 or something oh okay yeah okay so it was a conscious it was a choice that's what they yeah. say these days it was a choice <laughs> and like one of the unfortunate <laughs> right at like causes probably or like of 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 this book above others like its success um was a bit of a, a, a gossipy angle yes. about about Foucault, this you know this high-ranking French intellectual at the time who I think had otherwise been very private about his illness and his death, you know, up till his death. Like, mm-hmm. and I think people were just kind of like hungry, hungry to know the the deets, essentially. Yeah, right? that, yeah, that's true. And I mean, and, and that comes through in the book too. Even in the book, he's described as being very kind of like not in denial, but very kind of like not upfront with anybody about the illness or sort of like trying to make light of it in certain ways, which we can talk about. So the book basically is, is an, is an, an account of um, a narrator who is named uh, Guibert and uh, is basically an account of his um, diagnosis and struggle with AIDS um in the mid to late 80s and um his kind of coming to grips with what was at the time a like just full-on relatively short-term death sentence um right which is it had you know has changed in various ways today it's still a obviously serious disease um but the the medicine and I mean, the medicine around it is just in a completely different place than it was then. But, and him sort of both trying to cope with it and the, sort of the mundanity of the day-to-day of having the disease and the doctor's appointments and the this and the that, while there also being another big, big plot surrounding a sort of potential vaccine slash like experimental treatment that he wants to um, get via one of his friends who happens to work in um, the pharmaceutical business. Um, and that's basically what the book is about. Right. That's the friend. That's, that is the friend. Cool. Yeah. So yes. uh, the title is a little bit of a spoiler. He does not obviously get, <laughs> he does not survive AIDS. No, but he doesn't die by AIDS either. Well, in real life. So Guibert in real life, you know, had, uh, had AIDS and, and was dying of it. And he, he got to the point where some of the, the you know side effects i think he like went blind basically yes. from 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 some uh you know side effect of the disease and ultimately tried to kill himself and it failed originally but then he died shortly after from complications from the attempt so sort of a a, a dark ending to to his life and he and he i mean he talks pretty like openly and coldly and matter of factly about contemplating suicide and and really like seriously giving it thought as an avenue uh in the book itself too he's just like yeah so i got two options like you know i'll kind of like like heroically struggle through this thing and and that's the wrong way to phrase it i'll i'll die through illness related complications uh and i'm totally also considering just like i don't know where he got keyed into the the essentially like painkiller or barbiturate or something that would uh kill him but yeah it, it it became like kind of the thing he was seemed to be more clearly leaning towards doing by the end the the ending <coughs> it's, not, it's not like and then i died you know it's not the, <laughs> right it's not like that kind of ending like it's, it's kind of a again strange in that way where it's just the ruthlessly autobiographical yet um guised account of his experience over like 
the better part of seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I, I did want to say that this is probably our first book that's pretty much like creative nonfiction. I, I would like I to think know that's probably exactly, a good term for it. I would like to know exactly like what was fictionalized in the writing, but it just seems more like we're reading a guy's actual journal entries over the course of, you know, six or seven years. Um, and even the ending, it doesn't really point to like he's about to die from the illness. It's, it's more like he's just rapidly fading away. So if there's truth in like the last entry too, you know? Yeah, I mean, I but think the book is, oh, no, sorry, I was just gonna say the book, the book is written in like a series of like one page to, I don't know, I think the most is what, like seven pages? per chapter but that, yeah like seven or eight pages the, i think is the longest so it's like there's one. something like 80 chapters in the whole thing and it i think it's a flat it's usually just, right oh is it really oh yeah um but yeah it just kind of flies by in that way it's like every chapter is like one or two pages that is just a different experience and it kind of goes back and forth from like talking about the morbidity of just how he's thinking to you know, the next chapter will be just like an interaction he's having with his friend or something, or one of his friends. It's it's not it's not uh, chronological. That's the other thing that was at least confusing to me. I found myself being like, "Oh, we're we're in '87, and now we're in '83, and blah blah blah." And I think he's giving more um, of an instinctive accounting of like the of of uh, of narrative here, where it's just like in hindsight now. He's like regarding these kind of things as more important or less important. Cause I think he, I don't know how much distance he had from Foucault's death or, or I don't know when he began the actual writing of this book itself. I, I don't really know, but you do jump around in time and get more of this like chronology of what was psychologically important and seemed to matter to him as being told in, in a certain order rather than just mm -hmm. time. Yeah, it's very yeah, like I, it's very like impressionistic in that way. It's very sort of like what you know, what is what is making itself relevant to me either in retrospect or in the current moment or whatever. Right. Uh, as I'm writing these these chapters or these entries or whatever. This dude was famous, man. That was like that was the first thing I noticed. I was like we're, we're getting the account of prob like the equivalent of some sort of celebrity socialite in Paris in the eighties, like yeah. he, ke he kept talking about all his thinly veiled celebrity friends and actors and Foucault and stuff. And it's just like, he's, he's jet setting off to like the set of an Akira Kurosawa movie. He's like an extra in uh, under the volcano. Like, I think he goes I mean? to the Oscars, doesn't he? At one point, yeah, he goes to the Oscars with a woman who uh, was ducking him after like agreeing to be in a movie he was writing. He, like, I read somewhere books. that that was supposed to be, uh, that that was a real actress too, that that was supposed to write. I think it was Isabella yeah. Johnny. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, is that how you say it? I don't know how you say it. I don't know. But, you, but you, yeah. But so, yeah, like, uh, I think maybe he was most famous at the time as for as a photographer. Yep. Uh, um, so he's he's kind of like all over the arts and and just really plugged into like, the intelligentsia of Paris and he he's kind of a jet setter he's he just stays all over Europe and knows all these like weird people like like we said he even knows like doctors on the bleeding edge of <laughs> like AIDS research and, and and pharmaceutical innovation and stuff which ends up kind of being a negative but who could have guessed that you know <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I think, and yeah, I think it's really interesting that that's the sort of picture that we get. I mean, it was a, also, a, like you say, the reality. Biber was famous and involved in art and, you know, like just new, rich, famous people. And I think it's interesting to like hear this story from that perspective, because like, I mean, okay, I, I mean, I'll just confess. I don't, I don't really know a, a lot of, I don't, I haven't read much like fictionalized literature about you know aids in this time i'm sure it, there it's out there but i don't i'm not i haven't read any of it really but you know when you, when i think about some of these movies that have been made about it or you know it, it the, the focus tends to be on like the everyday kind of person who was you know just out there just 
living their normal like down down to earth like often poor sort of you know lower lower class life and those are the people who tended to be kind of doubly affected by the disease and at its heyday but i think it was just really interesting to to see it from this other perspective of someone who was wealthy in the arts just kind of like you know i don't know if you guys got that sense at all too but i, I it's that that was interesting to me yeah i mean i i think i read it more i, I was i was really into the more not into it but i was reading it from from the morbid side and from a from a dude that he was just expressing what it felt like to have this disease in like a really honest way so i didn't really i don't know i didn't really look at it from the perspective of his class i guess i was more just putting myself in in his head and i think he had a really he has a really good way of just expressing how probably anyone who had the disease felt you know just like he, there's so many passages of just like really beautiful written words that are or written sentences that are just like crushing um and it j just for like the sense of, of of being immortal too um mm -hmm. and just facing facing your own death um he just really grasped that i mean obviously he was experiencing it but he had a really amazing way of putting it on on paper well he even talks about that as 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 something that's initially kind of like baleful and uncomfortable and then becomes again, you know, morbidly beautiful to him in certain ways. Like he, you know, he's an aesthete or however you say that. So like he does kind of like, that is his, I would say also coping mechanism, which I think is pretty, pretty much stated overtly by himself in the book. He's like, I'm just kind of writing, like I give more of a shit now about just sort of getting every last cognizance, out of my head beforehand but like he talks about how like this dude who he fucking despised and he's being really like he's just like yeah this piece of shit <laughs> like i couldn't look i i saw him queued up in some sort of like clinic waiting room and i had to leave because i was so disgusted by like the 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 democratizing or like the the, the equalizing of us being both ill like both having AIDS, like I hated the idea that we were now like brothers in some sense, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, that, that was very, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. I think it's, I'm trying to find, cause you're right, Matt, there are a couple of passages where it becomes this sort of like, you know, <laughs> um, I don't know the right way to put it, but like this sort of morbidly celebrated thing where it's sort of the, this like, like beautiful and like, you know, desirable in some way where it's like, it's almost, again, gotta, you, you said he's like this sort of, he's an, he's an esthete and that, that is, that comes through in this in a number of ways. And I think I, I like you said, I think it's sort of a coping mechanism and like the book, you know, the last chapter, we, we not to, whatever spoilers this is if you've ever listened to this podcast I mean. <laughs> have we ever not yeah but you know he frames it the first line of the last chapter is my book is closing in on me not yeah. not the disease not like you know anything else and he, he him that's a sort of like subplot of him trying to finish these this book that he's working on and that's what he feels sort of most oppressed by and i think that sort of framing the whole discussion with him working on a work of art is interesting in and of itself i think that's a relatable action probably for someone who's facing death is like a healthy way to go about it is like to distract yourself by doing a project of some kind and even to the point of getting oppressed by your project is probably a maybe not a better way of coping but it is a coping mechanism i would say do you think uh, do you think that just the French literary tradition also helps in that in some way with like de Sade and and uh, Bataille and all these kind of people like he is um, Guibert is kind of considered to be someone influenced and and take them taking the mantle of those kinds of thinkers and writers. I think that I, I can totally see that in the in a, a few ways in this book. I mean, certainly the sort of like, you know. There's, there's obviously French literature has a sort of reputation for like just existential morbidity and despair in general. <laughs> right. 
Um, but specifically those those two that you mentioned, Bataille and um, Desaad, you know, specifically like interested in the body and, you know, like violence and kind of sort of uh, <laughs> explicit descriptions of, of bodily functions and acts and stuff. And that is absolutely in here. But well, you, just, you know, you've got like Le Petit Moore, like being such a fucking like clear idea that controls all of that kind of right. all those people. You know what I mean? Just like yes. sexuality and death kind of just intermingling and becoming somewhat indistinguishable. Is that I saw I saw a hilarious tweet the other day. I think I re- I think I retweeted it and it was just it was just the French call death the big cum. <laughs> <laughs> Death is the fat nut. <laughs> but that's move, but that is actually France, that's man. actually kind of what's going on here in some ways. Hey man, listen, sex and death, the only two things worth writing about. Get that coffee, people. <laughs> we are dangerously close to that though. <laughs> Damn it. Um, it's all right. Yeah. But 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 yes. Anyway, yes. Cause I mean it's not, you know, it's not like uh I don't know. I think it's the book I think walks a really fine line between graphic and clinical and it does it in a really kind of subtle way where you 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 get these vivid graphic descriptions of various sorts of symptoms and physical manifestations of the disease and stuff but you also get the sort of just like like numbing mundanity of the doctor's appointments and going to the clinic and filling out this or that paperwork. And like those, I feel like those coexist in the book in equal measure. And it's a really sort of positive interplay. Yeah. I mean, for, for someone like my, my, I know Matt and Gabe know, but my mom died like a year and a couple months ago. And I was, you know, I was reminded of that a lot because I was constantly in the hospital experiencing what she was going through and interacting with nurses and doctors. And Gubert talks a lot about like how you just kind of become a number once you're once you're in the hospital system, your identity is just pretty much gone, and right. you're you're just like a you're part of these people's day to day job, and they're thinking about like uh, I've been working for eight hours, I want to go home and watch Netflix. Um, and that is just, I was reading this book a lot from the perspective of like, there's just something wrong with healthcare in general. And there always has been, it's fucked up and impersonal um, and sad. And you just, you end up just like not being treated like a human by the people that are your direct medical staff. It's like, if you don't have family around, you're just a number in a bed just and people are coming in every few hours to like take your blood pressure and they don't say anything to you um but it's 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 worse in this respect because it's like the 80s and they're all you know the people that are infected with this disease that has you know certain connotations to it obviously so they're like doubly repressed by the system it was sad yeah you can tell there's a lot of because we're dealing again like gabe said with with somebody with a higher profile socially um, you get this weird element of keeping your name out of the press and dancing around specifics and um, lying and all that kind of stuff. Like, it's just like not something the, the random like junkie is going to be fuck all concerned with, you know what I mean? It's just like, but you know when you're talking about people like Michel Foucault and uh, these other artists, uh, yeah, there's just added element of like, let's like be delicate about this. There's a whole there's a whole cultural, socio, fucking political uh, uh, connotation that comes crashing in with all of this. Um, although I will say, even though this is discussing. You know, this is written by a gay man in the 80s during the AIDS crisis. There's still like, you get the sense that it's like, it's a subcultural kind of thing. It's all kept underground. But uh, I don't know how to describe this. But the rep- the idea of, of that identity being repressed didn't, didn't loom as large as I was expecting it to. Do you guys feel that way or does that make sense? That came, that, that definitely came through for me. I think, you know, there's, um, 
the way and and again i just don't have the historical or cultural knowledge to know like what what it meant to be openly gay in france during this time period like yeah (laughs) just, just you know just don't know um but i certainly felt like it was yeah like you said there's some undercurrent of it being um subcultural there's some undercurrent of it being sort of like a there's a really powerful description at some point in the beginning i think that's written from as if foucault said it foucault's character who's named uh, muzil M- i don't know how to say this M- muzil muzil yeah muzil um where he's Muzzle. describing a trip he took to san francisco or something um and what went to some bathhouses and stuff and it, it was almost like a thing of like solidarity it was almost like unifying the community from right. that perspective like from his perspective anyway in the book but yeah it definitely felt more uh yeah it didn't quite feel that 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 level of oppression and suppression that i sort of have come to associate with being you know gay or queer in that era in the united states yeah least. i know the line you're talking about like uh was it new zeal who was talking about going to the bathhouses and he said that they were talking about how some of them are closing down and then i think new zeal says like no they're not closing down they're like more popular than ever because we're getting to the point now where like we're in there talking about this disease and we actually are talking to each other <laughs> like it's not just like this underground dirty thing um to the individuals that are involved in it anymore it probably still is to much of the culture in france that are like you know conservative normal people but normal i shouldn't say normal yeah gotcha (laughs) i got but um i thought that part was like kind of beautiful though he was like we're actually all in this together now and we all are like talking to each other about it and that is like a weird positive morbid thing that has happened well, I think some of it is just a function of, like we keep saying, the fact that uh, Guibert and Foucault and these people are like uh, well-known, respected, f- well-off, socially plugged in artists and thinkers. And therefore, I-, I imagine, again, that there's a little bit less constraint there. It's kind of more of like a celebrated, almost potentially like quirk or some other slightly condescending probably look at it from the outside but like what i found the most affecting by the first about the first half of the book is because musil is not only used because he's just like i think i think was clearly desired to be identifiable uh but like kind of represented the first wave of this thing uh the other person the only person i can think of uh in the u.s with a similar magic status. johnson not magic johnson although that's you know yeah that's decent, yeah he's an example um but uh uh rock hudson uh who was like you know famously kind of snubbed by nancy reagan after going to i believe france to seek treatment in like a military hospital or something um and he died a year, I think, after Foucault. Uh, and and that, that was like a kind of big deal because not only was he absolutely in the closet, um, in the public eye, um, but, you know, he, he kind of brought a, a, a greater mainstream attention to it. I don't know really what he's considered in terms of his, like, effect on awareness and whatever public perception, but that was a big fucking deal. Like he, you know, he was a huge male movie star. Uh, yeah. But just these guys, these guys like at the beginning of it, when it's just this terrifying unknown, like just this like dark cloud, just sort of rolling in over things. And people are kind of aware of like it on the horizon. And I I feel like that ominousness really comes through, especially at the beginning. Cause they're laughing it off and there's not concrete information about it. And like at one point, uh, Musil slash Foucault is like how a gay cancer, how funny would that be? Like, he's just joking about it. He's like, that would be hilarious. Uh, and then by the end I was like, I mean, I think his death, the way it was written was maybe one of the more, like, I, I got sad. I, I was actually like made sad by the book, you know, like, profound way just like 
he's just an old man, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It's very intimate. And again, Guy Bear himself is pretty ruthlessly just laying it out no matter who it is. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. So like Musel's death was very affecting in the way like he's like a, a he's one of these high profile deaths. Um, but then also and, and cavalier about it. And it just like the way you can kind of ride that line between ignorance and absolute panic um, as the disease kind of ebbs and flows. And then just his final moments were really. Whew, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I was I was very sad. I had to stop reading. Uh, yeah, I that was Fuc the M M Musil's death was very very sad because it it's also just describing like in the book which I think this was true in Foucault's real life too. He was in the middle of trying to write some like big project, big intellectual sort of book that he was working on and he's sort of like trying to dictate things to people and just forgetting what he's saying and like just totally getting lost and it's like so depressing to 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 think of someone like that specifically like Foucault's like this titan this intellectual giant like mm -hmm. just not even being able to string a sentence together about the thing he's been thinking about for his whole life right on his deathbed and he it's funny because he Musil is kind of this parallel figure to Guibert in a way mm. I would say like he's got this interminable Musil does he says that damned like what like that damned endless book yes he's, yeah he's the never always writing book, yeah. and he's you know he's being he's being he's being hit with claims of like, oh, he's, uh, he's demented now. And he's, uh, he can't think and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it feels like such a counterpoint to Guibert. Who's like, he's, he's snappy with it. He's just trying to, he's trying to write and he's trying to write things fast and like nail it, but like not fucking do that, not just collect words and never publish. Right. And you have to imagine that his experience with M Musil's death, is and seeing him in that state sort of was a motivational factor for for Guibert sort of like trying to finish this book trying to pump this stuff out uh before what was he the got timeline? to that point when because Guibert is like he's suspicious of being positive like seropositive like in 83 mm -hmm. yeah right? I mean it's a on, long ass time yeah. Like, th like I said, the book, the book almost takes a decade span. Like yeah. he, he kind of, he's kind of thinks he has it like way early. Yeah. The, he the doesn't get tested until like 86 or something, right? Like yep. it takes him a lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. The chronology is, like you said, the book is not chronologically written. So it's hard to kind of pin down exactly when, what is happening. But I think that's, that's basically right. Well, also, I don't know if you guys knew about this latency period but that that's also another terrifying element of AIDS uh, that mm -hmm. I just didn't know I'm like six to nine years I don't know if that's still the case or whatever but like a whore uh, you can live almost a decade yourself without just like it in there before it even starts like making you a little ill and stuff it's that's just in there <laughs> it's just in there. in there dude I hate that yeah yeah uh, there were definitely, I definitely learned some things reading this book. And again, I don't know what the state of it is these days. I mean, I, I know a little bit about it, but not, I'm not a, you know, an expert. You can basically, anymore. I mean, these days you can take like, I think just one pill a day. And I think you can live forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are forever. like, there are like, uh, there Get are AIDS, really bad side immortal. effects. <laughs> There are certain things like from the pills that you can like you can still develop like cancers and stuff, I think, from the pills, but they're late in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think they actually give you like really vivid dreams. Like people that have HIV and take these pills have like crazy dreams mm -hmm. every night. But is it's better than like, uh slowly dying, fading away like into a bed. Prep? Is that what that is? Or is that like uh is prep a is prep a preventative? See, this I think is, it's a preventative. I think prep is preventative. Yeah. Yeah, it's preventative. It's not a yeah. vaccine, but it helps. It's like a preventative thing. Um, I did want to read a passage um, real quick. Uh, yeah, I've got a ton. I think this may be a, a reading yeah. heavy uh, episode, actually. Yeah. Let's do it. This is, the, this is a passage on 172 where it's more like romanticizing 
Hubert's view of his own illness. And Dude, that's literally what I had open. <laughs> you, no way. Do you want to read it? No, um, no, you're no, better at no, it. no, 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 go ahead. Okay. I, I would say, I mean, I don't think romanticizing the disease was a huge aspect of the book. I think that it was a smaller side of how we wrote about it. I think for the, for the most part, he wrote about it in fear and like terror. Yeah, but yeah. There, I, I wouldn't there say it's are... romanticization. It's like a, it's just, you know, it's basically just memeing on something that's, that scares you. No yeah. way. I, I highlighted this same fucking chunk too. Did you? Right. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's, um, Goubert is talking to his friend or about his friend Jules. Jules had once said to me at the time when he didn't believe we were infected that AIDS was a marvelous disease. It is true that I was discovering something sleek and dazzling in its hideousness, for though it was certainly an inexor inexorable illness, it, was, it wasn't immediately catastrophic. It was an illness in stages, a very long flight of steps that led assuredly to death, but whose every step represented a unique apprenticeship. It was a, it was a disease that gave death time to live and its victims time to die time to discover time and in the end to discover life so in a way those green monkeys of africa had provided us with a brilliant modern invention and unhappiness once you were completely sunk in it was a lot more livable than the presentiment of unhappiness a lot less cruel in fact than one would have thought that was a good one it also it's funny to me like i think there's so the, much in there i mean there's the more too right monkeys. yeah yeah, if you, if you want to keep reading, I just I cut it off there. Yeah, I just want to uh, just say, uh, do it, man. If if life was nothing but the presentiment of death and the constant torture of wondering when the axe would fall, then AIDS, by setting an official limit to your lifespan, six years of seropositivity plus two years with AZT, which was an experimental drug at the time, uh, in the best of cases, or a few months without it, made us men who were fully conscious of our lives and freed us from our ignorance. So yeah, just like, um, you know, I, I think a disease that, or I, disease, I think a, an idea that's actually like unifying in, in other illnesses as well, you know, just this kind of, you get, you get a, you get a, a hard deadline essentially. Yep. And it clarifies think, a lot of shit. I think that AZT drug, I'm not sure, but I think it was like a, a, a cancer drug, right? I'm not, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either, but I, I think it's sort of like a chemo drug that, that they took that was like too harsh for most cancers, but mm. it was like the best they could do at that time. So it's sort of, it's like a pain reducer almost. It's well, I think it's just like, like a cell killer. Like, you okay. know, yeah. just like kills like all cells and right. hopefully you survive it. Right. Um, yeah. And there was like, it was like, you take that and can you, ha you couldn't be under a like 200 T cell count. Right. Or it was like too dangerous because you'd have nothing. It would just kill all of it. And then you had like that in conjunction with like an infusion of hemoglobin or uh -huh. globulin or, or, or something weird. I mean, all this stuff also like I don't think even is relevant now because like I'm sure it's just actually dealt with in a more precise way. Yep. But but that's pa that's part of the horror of this book and part of the tragedy of like the main storyline with Guibert himself is like this thing AZT. Uh, was kind of dangled in front of him at some point, and like the latter half of the book is 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 him slowly coming to to realize that he was given a glimmer of hope that he was like sustaining himself on more than he wanted to admit, and just this doctor, this friend, quote unquote, Bill, the doctor, Bill, Bill, American, significantly, I would say, uh, is just somebody who keeps ducking him after he just makes all these fabulous promises and then just uh, completely ducks him. And eventually it just becomes clear that like AZT is just fucking snake oil. Like, you know, there's a, there's a doctor attached to it who I forget, uh, I think invented a uh, polio vaccine. It's supposed to be the, 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 the fictional analog of the polio vaccine. That I forget his name. Uh, so like an honest doctor and scientist. And then like the guy, the Jonas Saul. Yes. Um, and then Bill is not a scientist. So, so Bill basically in the, in the world of the book sort of works for Jonas, the Jonas Salk character. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But he's just pushing the idea. Like he's a physician, I suppose, but like he's, he's overselling, he's overselling this thing and he's making a lot of crazy promises to not just 
Ski Bear, but like a couple other people. He's like, I'll pull some favors. Like, this is a miracle drug. You're, you're, you could be okay. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get you in line for the test for, for the test groups and, and you'll, you'll get first dibs on it. And then right. of course, like the ultimate at the end, the ultimate fucking like dark comedic, like fuck you is like Bill. The only person that Bill actually gets early access to this drug is like this young kid that he's having sex with. Right. Who's yeah. way, way at a way earlier stage of it. Yes. And he strings along Gibert for about, I think it's like a year and a half. At least. At the least. Um, yeah, and that ends up being like the greatest cruelty. Like one of the one of the one of the late like last couple sentiments that gets across, like in the last couple pages of the book, is literally just the phrase like fuck you, Bill. <laughs> like, I'll well, gotta say yeah, that before I die. The third to last sentence of the book is fuck you, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I was reading the I forget it was the foreword or the afterword, but the 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 title of the manuscript that he originally submitted was just "fuck you, Bill." <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Which you know, you know what else I was thinking of? Did you guys remember that movie? I think I mentioned this before, but like not here, but like Awakenings. Do you remember that movie? No, I don't know. With, I don't know. It's got it. it's got De Niro in it. It's about that Oliver Sacks. Um, it's a it's a film version of like an Oliver Sacks book about is that this... the like music synesthesia guy? No, that's musicophilia. Come on now. No, 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 no. What? No, the Oliver Sacks. Who am I thinking of? I don't know. Okay. No. Shine? Yeah. Yeah. Oliver Sacks, dude. He's the dude he wrote like um This is your brain on music or musicophilia? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm that's that's his shit. He's just a psychologist. I don't I don't or like a a I believe he's a neuroscientist, right? He's got good books. Uh, the, um, he wrote a the man is wife, the man who mistook his wife for a hat and shit. Yeah, that, that's yeah. right. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking of, dude. Okay, cool. Never mind. Oh, Swear I'm si- God. oh my God, dude. On oh, God, dude. Uh, but it's a whole story, basically about a cautionary tale about like um, I don't know what it is like giving false hope essentially like he like sax ends up finding a cure for these people who are all in this like just comatose state and they all end up awakening and they all just have like they're just it's like they're unfrozen from time like they just they're all like what year is it fucking i still think i'm a a teenager but i'm like a 50 year old person and uh and it's like this miracle and he's like so proud of himself he's like yeah i fucking cured these people uh, this isn't a good analogy because there's actually a cure involved for even a, <laughs> a small amount of time, which is not the case with Bill. Uh, but the point of the, that story being like, these people end up kind of slowly going back into a comatose state, like slow enough. And so that they're like hyper aware of it. They've gotten a taste of like what it is to be alive again and conscience conscious and like whatever. And they hate sex. They're like, you should have fucking like, how dare you, like, cure us? They, they hate, if you didn't, they if you didn't sex. know, sax Oliver, Oliver oh, sax. Okay. They love sex. They start fucking in the movie, and they're like, this is also awesome. I remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So they're just. It like, sounds. It sounds a little bit like Austin Powers. It's um. There's an element <laughs> of Austin Powers. I'll grant you, but it's a small crumb. <laughs> a legend in his own time uh that's that's just where my pea brain goes to i know well they those people all had a warm liquid goo phase uh where they were thawed out (laughs) but yeah the point being just like these people ended up being like they wished to they have to have stayed sick like they just they didn't like this false moment of 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 hope it was crueler than to just have stayed where they were and i that's like i think that's where gibert i think ends up in a way being in in terms of like this whole like azt goose chase yeah i think um i've got another passage that i want to read kind of in this connection uh or some somewhat related and i also just wanted to flag in the flat in the passage that you read paul and it's not i wouldn't say like it's a prominent feature of the book at all but the the role of race is kind of interesting and whenever they talk about the the origins of the disease they mention these 
the, the African monkey line recurs a few times. And it's sort of interesting to think about. First of all, I don't know just historically if we've like nailed down precisely where AIDS came from and if that's the like correct like origin of the disease. I just don't know that. Uh, guy had a guy had sex with a monkey in Africa. Is that is that confirmed? Is that like really no no true? no okay. just, no no? That's the <laughs> fucking that's the, that's like the joke thing. Yeah, joke that, which might have some truth to it, but no one really knows. Yeah. Okay, so I just thought I just wanted to flag that because it comes up a couple times. Is sort of well, they also they also say he also says the Chinese virus, not in accordance with the AIDS virus, but he mentions like the Chinese flu a few times. Well, okay, I I want to talk about reading this book in the context of COVID because I think it's there's a lot there that's kind of like, you know, obviously this is not the same as as the AIDS pandemic, but some of that same ominousness and some of the like false hope about solutions and, you know, vaccines and stuff like that, I feel like is we've been going through in a, in a it's something that's sort of related to some of the stuff I, he writes about. I just want to add an addendum just based on a fucking real quick cursory glance. It seems like there is some sort of like animal to human passing with uh, chimps um, in like the Congo in like the 1920s or something like okay. that. But I don't know what that is. Something about the simian immunodeficiency virus being closely related and, and mutated or something. Well, even that, it's kind of interesting, again, to think about the COVID tie-in because it's like, it's totally. the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, someone fucked a, fucked a monkey and now we have AIDS. At the right. beginning of all of this, it was like someone ate a bat and now we have COVID. Some, right, bat some, soup. Some, and now... some, some, you know, some uh, whatever, Chinese wet market. I think bat yeah eater. and it's like it's it's racialized it's i don't know so i just think that it's interesting uh well i think it's also like the it's also pretty like uh demonizing and homophobic because i think people jumped to that anecdote back then like oh some gay guy fucked a monkey because gay people are horny degenerates yes. and that yes and they yeah. deserve it um absolutely so so fucked up when actually it it does seem to be more of a case of people eating animals that are weird (laughs) yeah (laughs) nothing no one's having sex i mean the 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 gay disease you know as it was called right it's like uh yeah that's just a completely like cultural and politicized thing that like it it, is so you know africa if anything is like a clear demonstration of just like it's it's just not (laughs) it's yeah it just i i don't know enough about like it's moved through America and like why the gay community was so ravaged by it. I, I, I just, I just am kind of ignorant on that front, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah. that was, that was just a culture war kind of bullshit op- opportunistic move there. So here's the passage I want to read. It's on page 50 and then I'm going to skip ahead and read like a very brief one from 51. So this is like right in the middle of that, that paragraph on page 50. Oh, I think um, I, I highlighted this one too. I, I bet that's going to happen a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, I felt better the moment I learned I had AIDS. I pay close, <laughs> I pay close attention to the virus's progress. Uh, I feel as though I know by heart the map of its colonizations, its assaults and retreats. I think I know where it's lying in wait and where it's on the advance. I believe I can feel the areas that are still untouched, but the struggle inside me and this one is organically quite real, the scientific tests are conclusive, is nothing for the moment, but just wait compared to the undoubtedly imaginary ailments that torment me. And then there's a, I'm skipping ahead to the next page just because I think it kind of flows from that, that claim. And he's talking about Bill. I sat down by his desk and I said to him, yes, I remember perfectly. This is exactly what I said to him in 1981, shortly before Bill was to mention for the first time the existence of this phenomenon that already bound us all together without our knowing it. Muzil, Marine, and so many others. Quote, I'll kiss the hands of the person who will tell me I'm doomed. And I just oh, think yeah, that that's, that's just like so like fuck. Yeah. Very French. Yes. Very French and existential. <laughs> and I just think just, that yeah, go ahead, Matt. Well, I was just gonna say it's it's that it's that great that weird gratefulness you feel mm-hmm. for someone pinning down a more diffuse kind of of pain and dread you know which is does end up being hugely mental which any it's not even hypochondriac it's just like it's that fucking 
shit where you just you feel bad for some reason and then you start thinking and you and your mind just runs on overdrive and i mean it's the it, yeah. it's the same kind of like this is a this is a dumb like obviously not as serious not okay it's not dumb but it's not as a, a serious as an example but that's the kind of stuff that's like what you hear i remember i remember you guys remember when cutting was a big thing back in back like when we were in school high school yeah <laughs> the cut the cutting phase yeah. like yeah i mean I'm, I'm sure that's still going on but I remember like there was a big thing about like people who were cutting as a sort of like way to focus that kind of like diffuse unnameable pain that like existential or physical pain that we all feel to some degree. And that like just making a physical fucking cut on your body was a way to just like channel all of that into one fucking space. And I feel like that's a similar kind of thing that he's describing in that passage. Right. Yeah. I think, there's a like he he knows like deep down that he has it he's getting all these symptoms and um he just wants an answer and the answer is like comforting when it finally comes i think but it 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 reminded me of uh we were talking before we started about our hypochondriac phases and i remember we were we were all all three of us at certain points just like i definitely have cancer i have a pain in my shoulder it's shoulder cancer like I, I i used to go to the doctor all the time. i mean i ended up having really bad things wrong with me but um none of them were like extreme cancer or anything lymphoma or anything but it's, i almost yeah. like you go I top shelf had, when you're like online you go you pick from the top shelf of diseases you're like okay this is an episode of doctor house basically yeah. when i'm thinking about my own personal issues exactly but i there were certain times too where I'd be like, I'm going to go to the doctor and they're going to tell me I have cancer and I can't, I just want them to say it because I know something's wrong. Tell right. me I have stomach cancer right now. It'll feel so good. But yeah, <laughs> but that's fucking so true. That's like a dark truth. Like, I really think that's yeah. actually like something that is important to take away is like, you know, when you're in psychological pain, which is the vast majority of it, um, I mean, obviously not when you're in like the extreme throes of a terminal illness, then it's physical, but like, uh, even, even if it's not, (laughs) I mean, this applies to things that aren't even necessarily physical ailments, like just like bad relationships, bad fucking work environment. It's shit. Like, you know, like, like you want a very, you want some destruction to happen or maybe, uh, no, you, you, you want to, you want to target uh you 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 like gabe was saying you want you want something to channel your energy into and it does end up being more something like cutting a lot of the time unfortunately right where it's like you're just doing a different kind of harm to yourself that like i i guess is a relief but it's like it's just harm still at the end of everything right that is a lot of the time needless well and there's so much like he writes so much about that phenomenon the like the, the focusing of pain and the sort of like hypochondriac kind of instinct. And um, so the, another passage that I, that I wanted to read, which comes just shortly before the one that I read is this might be my favorite passage in the book. This is on 46. One of them it's up there when he's talking about, you know, he, not when he finds out he has AIDS, but it's some other ailment that he finds out he has. It's like some kidney problem or something, or he's got like a, yeah, like renal, like basically like, uh, what are they called when you piss out fucking rocks? Kidney stones? Kidney stones. It's like something similar to kidney stones. <laughs> um, so he says, as it happened, this investigation finally turned up something which both relieved and disappointed me because Dr. Nocourt announced that the problem was an extremely rare but completely benign phenomenon that he'd never encountered in his 30 years of practice. A renal malformation, probably congenital, a kind of pocket where crystals could accumulate, thus provoking that sharp pain in my right side which the urologist believed could be eliminated by massive doses of sparkling water and lemon. (laughs) But even before I could devote myself to a frenetic consumption of lemons, the twinge in my right side promptly disappeared. Now that I knew what was causing it, and for a very short period of time, I was left like an idiot without any pain at all. And I just (laughs) thought that was just so like, so descriptive of that feeling. Like that was so like- You, you, when you, totally. when you, it's almost like when you don't feel sick, when you don't feel like you're in pain, you feel stupid. You're like, what is like, I'm missing something. Totally. And I, I have like a anecdotal story about that. Like I, I got a lot of colonoscopies when I was in like my late twenties 
and I was having a lot of stomach issues and I had pain in my right side and I did, I, I drank all the stuff and I was in the hospital in the morning and my doctor came over and he's like, what does any work hurt? And I was like, it still hurts my right side. And he was like, well, when we're in there, we're going to check for all these diseases. And he was like listing off all these kind of tame ones. And then he said, we're going to check for lymphoma. And it just terrified the shit. I mean, I'm, I definitely have that. That's what I have. Right. But I, I ended up waking up and he was like, there's nothing. We couldn't find anything. He was like yawning. He was like, why are you even here? Um, <laughs> and my pain, sure enough, like instantly went away. <laughs> I just had no pain anymore. Um, so that happened very to, that, psychological. That happened to me basically this week. I mean, I think, I think we should talk about. I mean, we can obviously we can come back. We got, we got, we got all night, baby. I got nowhere to be. But There's no time limit. The the sort of I think you're right, Paul, to keep returning to this um, question of the way this book portrays the medical and pharmaceutical industries because I think that's like a really really big part of the book, and it's very uh, uh, it's as unflinching as anything else. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, but I went to get, go get a COVID test this week and not, not necessarily because I had any symptoms or anything like that, but just because they recently opened it up here where you can go just without any symptoms and just because, and I just kind of want to go for peace of mind, you know, cause I've been right. whatever. And, um, I call on the phone and I'm like, can I get a test? And they're like, oh, yeah. And they're like, do you have, and she lifted off like 10 symptoms. Like, do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. And she, you can, she like almost audibly sighed, like, okay. And you still want to come in? <laughs> and, I was just like, and I was just like, yeah, yeah. I just, just, you know, whatever. And of course it took 30 seconds. I'm negative and all that. So, it, but it's that, that sort of like detached, like, why are you here? You're bugging me. I have better things to do. Like, weird attitude in the medical profession which yeah. of course of course in many cases just flat i just of course in many cases they do genuinely have better things to do and there are genuinely people who need it more than some you know like comparatively healthy hypochondriac you know 30 young 30s white guy i just mean i i just wanted to counter with i kind of like that uh on not every time but a lot of the time I, I like the just administrative cavalier attitude. Like it in some way fucking comforts me. Cause like, again, anecdotally, these are all such lame <laughs> situation, but like, I was also panicking about our pain. analogies I, are terrible in the face of this book. Well, it's not an analogy. It's a, uh, <laughs> no, I know. Uh, I'm just saying like, yes, yes, certainly. Just Where acknowledging that we're not drawing comparisons between any of these examples. And no, but just like I, I had uh, again, yeah, like pain, localized pain, just fucking on on my side, and I was event it didn't go away for a while, so I was like, my appendix is gonna burst. <laughs> Eventually, I was just like, I have a, a, my my one of my organs went toxic and it's gonna explode. Like, and I just <laughs> I went from just calm for like three days and just be like, it's fine, we'll just see what tomorrow brings, and then suddenly I was just like, literally like half limping because my side hurt so bad to the hospital like fuck fuck it's gonna explode uh and yeah i just i at the time uh this i, I was living somewhere else but like i just had this doctor who was just like she was just like what like what the fuck are, what do you what you have pain and i was like yeah i think I'm, my shit's gonna explode and i'm gonna go sick oh you're gonna cry little baby you got pain yeah. in your side <laughs> And she was literally like, I was like, my appendix hurt. I think my appendix is going to burst. And she's like, where's the pain? It's there. Your appendix is here, you fucking idiot. <laughs> and she was like, what, do you have and a she, diaper on? Let me see your fucking diaper, man. Yeah. And she was like, I just. And then Matt got a boner. Yeah. I, well, whatever. And then uh, there was, and then she was like, there, it's just, it's like inflammation. Like, well, let's give you this anti-inflammatory. It went away instantly. Yeah, again, same thing. Yeah. Almost psycho not psychosomatic, but like but yeah, a huge component of it is it, I mean, it does go I, I do understand what you're saying. Like you sometimes you want just like a doctor who's like dismissive of you. But I've had a few instances where I've like something was definitely wrong and I've gone to the ER yeah. and had all these tests and then the doctor's like too dismissive. It makes me kind of think that I want AI to be a real thing and I want all doctors to be nice robots with ai personalities are like oh are you okay this could be something serious you are very, a smart man like <laughs> very scary but statistically better at catching yeah shit, but right i mean i don't know how i feel about it i want i don't know either 
I well, want to. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Right, I'm man. just uh, like Gibert. Like, I, I just wanted to like emphasize what you're saying. Like, he he does a good job of kind of running the gamut of types of medical experiences or yes. like experiences with medical professionals. Cause there's like the cranks who are like, one says like he has like dysmorphophobia or something insane where it's yes. like fear of illnesses that are, will make you look weird or something like that. And, uh, and then he has like hyper dismissive people. And then he's, and then like, I think the big saving grace in terms of like medical professionals is Dr. Chandy. Yes. Uh, who is like another figure that's pretty large in the book. Yeah. Chandy is sort of his personal physician who is also, also kind of gets grifted by Bill uh, in the that's end. That's Bear's take on it. I don't yeah, know how right. true that is, but yeah, it seems like it. That's how it's presented. Um, I think that I think, real quick, I just want to say, that I think that does bring in the, uh, the little bit of class elements throughout like I think he yeah. had a doctor in the beginning that died, right? Yep. And then he gets then he gets shifted around to these other doctors who just think he's going crazy. And I think he finds Shanty who's like more receptive of his status, I would say. I think wasn't was he friends with uh Foucault, that doctor? Or was he That might doctor? be how they get connected. I forget how they get connected originally. But I I'm, I think my point is just that like because I think it was because of his status in his class that he was able to find a doctor who was more supportive yeah. of what, where he was, where he was going in his illnesses, which I don't think is true for probably the majority of people that were not. not in his, his, no, his yeah, absolutely status. not. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, so I wanted to read this passage just because it reminded me, I'm thinking of the, the farm, sort of pharmaceutical industry and some of the, the ways this book overlaps with that. And I just thought it was really funny. It was, it's just a funny passage because it, it, captures so well a reaction that I have all the time when I'm just watching commercials for various medications. Oh, the um, side effects. Yeah, the, yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, the side yeah, effects yeah. passage. It's so fucking funny. So this is um on 211. And uh and uh, Matt, this also sort of overlaps with the 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 Thomas Bernard conversations, which we you can bring, you know, jump into whenever. I so will. yeah, no, I know. Um on February 10th, I picked up my capsules of AZT from the Hôpital Rochelle Pharmacy and hid them under my coat when I left because some dealers on the sidewalk looked as though they'd like to steal them from me for their African pals. Again, there's always this weird, like, the African stuff is just dropped in kind of seemingly randomly, but I wonder if there's more to it than I think, that. I think I, I just, I think... In I'm the not way saying, that it, you know, yeah. Well, I think the in the way that there's like a little bit of a Middle Eastern preoccupation now in yes. France, uh, a lot of African immigrants was like more the issue back then. I think maybe yes, I and I mean it's also still true today that that you know people, black people specifically, are more affected by AIDS than any other yeah. population. I think right. Yes. Um, but as of today, March 20th, as I finish getting this book into shape, I still haven't touched a single capsule of AZT. Each patient can read on the label the list of quote unquote more or less irritating symptoms this medication can cause. Nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, headache, skin rash, stomach ache, muscular pain, tingling sensation in the extremities, insomnia, intense fatigue, drowsiness, <laughs> diarrhea, dizziness, sweating, shortness of breath, indigestion, taste disorders, chest pains, coughing, mental sluggishness, anxiety, frequent need to urinate, depression, aching, hives, <laughs> itching, flu-like symptoms, genital dysfunction, disintegration of the sensory faculties, impotence. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, I, that's like my exact feeling whenever I see this, like, see a, a commercial for a, a medication where it's like in the last half of a second of the commercial, they squeeze in like 50 awful sounding side effects. It's like, it's like, it'll be like a medication for depression. You know, it's like some antidepressant and it's like may cause suicidal ideation. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, it's like, it's like the, it's like happy fun ball from SNL. Yeah. It's like, yeah. To bring up another thing. That's just like, yeah. Happy fun ball may cause death. Death is the last one basically. So, yeah, I think, I, yeah. I, I think he has a lot to say about, about the, and, and again, the fact that the title character, Bill, the friend is this pharmaceutical exec, this like slimy um, sort of shifty pharmaceutical executive is a, is a 
to me, a p- politically significant point that he's making. Yeah, he's driving. He's an American uh, who's like got a a condo, like a he- like a cool condo in like a, a high rise in Miami. He's driving around in the a jag red, in a red Jaguar, uh, just constantly. You know, I mean, again, this is out of. I guess as much as I don't want to because of the sentiments about Bill that this book instilled in me, like, I don't know who this person is. It's obviously somebody who is real, I would say at this point. Like, there's nobody who doesn't have some sort of, like, real-life analog or is not just sort of renamed lightly. Uh, But, yeah, the way the book presents it, Bill is an absolute fucking monster. Like, it just turns out that he's some sort of, like, power-tripping megalomaniac who is also you know he's gay himself and he, he's seemingly uh like also just kind of like tangling aids medication as bait to fuck like people it's like terrible. other people it's so like, so dark yeah so it's it's yeah it's pretty dark yeah and i think yeah i mean it because it, the book's titled after bill i can't point to it as like the main crux of what he was trying to write about but it is a significant thing that Bill is a part of the medical industry Mm -hmm. and so much of the book is kind of like a reflection on dealing with, with that. Um, So I, I I suspect that Hubert had like strong feelings about it. Well, certainly. I mean, that like he, he wrote, I mean, he had Bill a book. I mean, he had you, Bill. (laughs) He had strong feelings about Bill for sure. But I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get in the head of his political views maybe a little bit. I'm not yeah. totally sure he was writing it from that perspective alone, but he was pointing out a significant issue well, culturally in that sector. Yeah, I mean, it's it's confu- it's it's conflicting because, right, like Guy Bear himself was uh, a highly privileged, upper-class kind of person with a lot of fucking connections. He's, yes. His account of the disease at that time is something that's going to be completely alien to the overwhelming majority of everyone who (laughs) had AIDS at the time. Like, so there's that, but like, there's a lot to say there. And in fact, his position, his privileged position allowed him to encounter certain people that are kind of really good, not good, but like he, he had direct connection with like the most criminal avatars of the pa- of like the powerful class that were kind of researching and administering cures and like dealing with this larger epidemic, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's a. I think you're right, Matt. It's kind of like a double edged sword where, yeah, his experience of this disease is like light years away from what a poor person would experience or someone who is like marginalized from from society in some other significant way. Um, but at the same time, and I think the book is conscious of this tension, right? It's sort of like we're talking about, there's that yeah. aspect to it. And then there's this other, so his, his, you know, even having access to this potential theoretical, you know, vaccine or whatever. But at the same time, at the, in the end, it doesn't fucking matter, right? It doesn't change the outcome for him at all. No. And in some ways makes it worse because he's instilled with this kind of like false hope that, you know, he started it, towards the end of the book, he starts to get almost like manically obsessed with this vaccine, like in getting it and like that it's right. it, it's his way, way out of all this. The, the, the first chapter of the book, which I think is really interesting, talks about how he's he has this like premonition that he's going to be the first person to ever survive AIDS. Right, yeah. And and by the end, it's clear that that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I think uh, it's 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 weird to look at it from his perspective because obviously, I think putting in putting myself in someone's shoes that has this disease, they would probably get a lot out of it. Like just from the descriptions of, you know, the beautiful descriptions of how he felt and how what he was going through and everything. Um, there, there is that gap between the majority of people that are not in the upper class that get get this disease and instantly had no hope. But I think you might be right, Gabe. Like, it, it might be a little bit worse, potentially, because Bill gave him that that hope. But at the same time, it's like he he had the opportunity to meet people in the medical industry that people that are, were in a less financial or like you know, a lower class 
wouldn't have been able to anyway. To so be clear, did, I'd you know, rather be rich and have the a thwarted opportunity for a vaccine than just yeah. be like well, basically home, like you know, like yeah. living on the street well, with AIDS and not have health insurance. Right he now. also he Screw also just that. had the opportunity to like live in Rome and just kind of wallow in, with his disease with his friends, like lay on rocks naked and think about his life. You know, yes. He, I'm not. I'm not saying in any way that that's it's it's a complicated thing. It's like if I had the disease and I was I had the opportunity to just like travel to Rome and live with it, yeah, I would definitely do that. So well, I wouldn't say he's privileged though because it still sucks. He's still can, dying. Can I just read, <laughs> Matt? What what were you say? I, I was just gonna say, you know, I I get why it's tough to talk about like his relative privilege when he's has AIDS, but like, right. uh, I think one of the important other things about the book that makes it um, good is uh, Guibert himself is not afraid to just he's he's laying it all on the line. So like he's talking about the ways he's a monster too. Like he's not, he's not this like a ama- saintly figure going through this while everyone else is taking advantage of him and stringing him along, you know, yes, he is an utter, he, you know, he's a very attractive man who was clearly living this like charmed life for a long time. And like, I don't know. He, he, he's just like a narcissist. Uh, he's, He's, he talks about the times that he's glad when he hears that other people have also been diagnosed with AIDS. Yes. He's, like, he's like, great. Like he takes, there's a number of occasions in which he takes perverse pleasure in fellow sufferers of the illness that he knows personally. He even, one of the most intense things he talks about is uh, he's in this kind of thruple. I, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, we, we need to talk about this. He's in this uh, relationship with a family. He is, uh, I mean, all right, look, clarify. It's a, uh, it's a uh, husband and wife, but the husband is bi or gay and, and has a cover wife or whatever, something like that. Uh, but beard. they're all having sexy with each other. Yeah. A beard. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's beard. not, it's, she knows about it. Like she's not in the, yeah. 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 Jules, Jules and Bertha birth. Uh, and, and Jules, Jules seems to travel around a lot. He, 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 he he's fucking often. Uh, and then they fuck each other and, you know, I think they have sex with birth as well, but like, you know, they're, they're a fam, they're ostensibly or not ostensibly, but like, you know, their outward appearance is, is one of a husband and wife and two kids. And, uh, at one point, Guibert is talking about, uh, him and Jules at this point are kind of like co spiraling down. They both have AIDS. Uh, they're both in the like coping portion of reckoning with it. They've kind of been strung along with this uh, cure and Jules kid gets sick. And the entire time they've been like, are my kids sick? Cause again, not sure of the mechanisms of the disease or whatever. And, and Giber is like pretty much just straightforward. Like I love those kids. And part of me was like, it would be, it would be incredibly in, in some level satisfying if those kids also had AIDS. Yes. And cause it know. would, cause it would, he, yeah, he talks about it as if there would be like this added layer of, of it's so fucked or, yeah. or what, because it's this like, the, almost like this added layer of him being their father or being yes. part of the family, part of the family in a more intimate way. If it turned out that the kids had AIDS too. Exactly. Like flesh of my flesh, like yes. in, in the, in the, in all of its qualities. Yeah. Really, really, like so he he goes to those kind of degrees of uh confession uh, yeah i didn't actually find them to be like i found them to be honest and in, in a good way like i can imagine i mean what if i if i had cancer and i was gonna die i would probably become like a little vindictive and be like why don't you fuck up cancer i hope you get cancer i i, I could totally see that um Oh, definitely. So I was I wasn't that like blown away by. It. I was mostly just like, this is where your mind probably goes when you're just in this state of fear constantly. Yeah, and, I mean, I think it was, uh, you know, and I think I don't know, but I think we're led to believe that Bertha has AIDS too. That they're like she has a moment with 
Guibert, where they kind of like silently acknowledge that they both kind of have it without saying it out loud. Um, so yeah, she's that, like, she she had like a coughing fit, right? For months and months and they yeah. kind of suspected. But then Guibert and, and Jules basically like don't want to even bring it up to her to right. like, as a way of like protecting her. They never talk, but, I don't think yeah. they ever talk about it with her explicitly. Yeah. But there's, but the, he does describe a moment where they are, are sort of like silently acknowledging it, I feel like. So it's sort of implied that she has it also. And then like, the, just chronologically, it's implied that like either they've all been having sex long enough that it would have transmitted to the kids potentially, or either through their birth directly or through breast milk or something like that. So, yeah. But it also, I mean, to get, to get back to Matt's point that he was just making, like, it's or or like you were saying paul like that is some to some degree you know you can see how your mind would go to a place like that uh and you and you think of you know there was that that big um story i don't know when this happened exactly but i think i want to say it was the 90s um where that guy found out he had aids and like just went onto a playground and started stabbing kids with a needle of his blood yeah and yeah. that's kind of what that passage made me think of or that section where he's thinking about the kids getting it yeah definitely yeah it's some sort of like um, or something i didn't i can't find it i've been looking for it but there's a passage where jules and gilbert are like know they have it together and um it's like a sex scene but it's like really freaking sad yeah i hope one of us can find it because that's worth reading i mean for whatever reason i didn't highlight it but i just i know i've i know what you're talking about like uh, and Jules in particular is described as someone who like kind of needs physical affection to be affirmed as a person and like feel oh yeah there's a great passage where he describes Jules as like someone who can't live without his his vanity and his beauty and he just yes. knows Jules is going to like crumble faster than him because he can't handle being like skinny and unattractive to people right insta disaster even if you're just yeah. don't have if you don't have AIDS that's going to be a disaster and that <laughs> yeah but uh, that was another moment of just like truthful honesty that, and great characterization too. Like you don't, I, I think that Goubert has a really inept quality of just characterizing people Adept. very quickly. Adept. What did I say? Inept. The opposite. Okay. I'm a fucking, sorry. Uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be like a dickhead, but I'm just, you know. Well, you can, you can correct my grammar on a literature podcast. It's fine. Okay. I will. By the way, audience, I've only read like I don't know, sixty books. So, fuck you. <laughs> However many episodes we have, that's how many books Paul's read. Yeah, pretty much. I went to art school too. So that's not no true, there. dude. I, the last I'll, dude, if you want to get into it about who's read less books, the last fiction book that I read before we started this podcast was like six years ago. Not yeah, but I mean. We were just talking what? about vocabulary and words, and you you've read more books overall. Philosophy. That's that's probably yeah. true. Yeah, if you include nonfiction. You, well, you're you an academic. So wearing a robe. I liter yeah, yeah. I, it's literally my job. So, right. It, higher education, it's just it's like you get more books than there's time in the day. And that's, okay, we were I, talking about the. Uh, oh, sorry. We were talking about the passage where Jules and Goubert have sex, and it's really like explicit and really sad, and we were trying to find it. Oh, did you did you highlight it? Uh, it's possible, but I don't. I don't think so. Oh. Like the way I do it, I highlight a ton of shit, but I dog ear a, the things that I really want to talk about, and I don't think I dog eared it. Uh, okay. So I, it would take me a while probably to find it. It's not minor, okay, but cool. it, it's just kind of like he describes a lot of, um, you know, it's it's just this notion of when the shit hits the fan, you find out who your friends are or and, and, you, right yeah and i think it, and i think you find out who you are right like there's a right there was a, there was a there was a passage um that i think i did dog ear yeah it's on 206 where this is where he's sort of con contemplating suicide with by taking the um digitaline dig digitaline or whatever yeah and he's sort of thinking about like what what would it what would i do what who would i turn into the moment i realized i was going to commit suicide Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is a really like, again, just confessional, like, 
d- like dark, beautiful passage. So mm-hmm. he's he's talking about. Um, I'll just start from the top of chapter 74. I hesitate to concoct this false prescription scribbled in haste on a scrap of paper with its abbreviations, its genuine looking corrections and dosages dictated by the cardiologists that have supposedly called in Paris in a panic over my great aunt Suzanne's attack of tachycardia to obtain the poison, the digitaline that would be the radical antidote to the HIV virus by snuffing out its harmful actions along with my heartbeats. Because I'm afraid that just having the bottle, having it actually within reach would be enough to push me to act immediately without thinking about it, without my action being related to any decision resulting from depression or despair. I'd add those 70 drops to a glass of water and drink them down. And then what would I do? Would I stretch out? uh, Would I stretch out on the bed, disconnect the phone, play play some music? What music? How long would it take before my heart stopped? What would I think about? Whom would I think about? Wouldn't I suddenly want to hear a voice, but whose? Wouldn't it be the voice, a voice I'd never have imagined wanting to hear at that moment? Would I want to masturbate until my blood stops dead, until my hand flies off my wrist? Have I just made a stupid mistake? Would I have been better off hanging myself? (laughs) And I, again, just that like, the the, the clarity that comes with some of this stuff or the, the potential clarity it's so matter of fact, like the yes. morbidity is just very matter of fact, but it's so relatable too. There's um, um th- there's this random thing from like I, I think it's like S- uh, Steppenwolf, I forget some Herman Hesse thing where it's like the the guy keeps talking about how the recourse of the knife is a great comfort to allow him to suffer through like things that are really horrific. I that's that's what it feels like to me the. Gi- Digitalin. Although, do does anyone know how Guibert tried to finally attempt suicide? I don't. I I don't know for sure. I do. I think it may have been some type of drug, like some type of overdose thing. But I'm not mm-hmm. totally sure. Folks, don't take. Don't try an OD. If you're gonna kill yourself, gun to the head or um, best best. Ver- <laughs> I'm sorry. No. <laughs> You can run a car. <laughs> run a car is probably the best way to go. Asphyxiation is probably the best way to go. Attempted overdose of sleeping pills. Ah, uh, yes. No, the, the best way to kill yourself is like the end of It's a Wonderful Life and then the angel comes and then you don't do it. There you go. Right. That's yeah. cur- Thank oh, you. Right. Because that's the only correct he'll, answer. An angel. He'll give you, yeah, he'll give you a view of the world if you weren't there and it'd be a huge, awesome thing. And then the whole town will just give you money. <laughs> Don't do it. If, if, if look at how happy people are when if you stick around, and you're like, oh right, yeah, 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 no, yeah, no, bet. Yeah. I. Um, yeah. What if he had AIDS though? What if he had AIDS? What about different story? What about a different movie? It's not a wonderful life. The movie. It's not a wonderful <laughs> life. Oh god. I like. Uh, you know, just to, again on the anecdotal tip. Uh, there like uh so like when uh there was a death in my family and it was kind of like a minor trauma to other fa- living family members uh i uh i just have another book recommendation which i think is kind of like somewhat it had a little moment of popularity but it's called being mortal uh i, I thought you were gonna say the lovely bones oh fuck you <laughs> the fault in our stars <laughs> this beautiful book about cancer and you know ugh. uh the five people you meet in heaven <laughs> <laughs> damn bringing it back uh fuck i can't remember the name of this author and if because if is i it, say it, is it's it gonna uh, be embarrassing. We'll, we'll, we'll stall some time for you while you look it up what yeah, do you think? Uh, what do you Peterson? Well, we're just like the final chapter. Isn't Jordan like, Peterson, like... the final chapter. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 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 twelve rules for life you learn in heaven. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was right. Atul Gawande is the name of the author. But and what's the not... book called again? I'm sorry. It's called Being Mortal. Okay. I mean, I, I, I this was like a, a kind of popular book, but like. Um, it was just about um, over medicalization of death and uh, like bedside manner and just kind of like, are there alternative approaches to the sort of medical fields? 
it it's basically this book that's like it's so against uh the kind of like switzerland assisted suicide thing which i find debatable uh or whatever i'm not uh my my thoughts on suicide are are complicated and kind of keep changing but like uh this book is is flirts with that where it's like yes people fucking die like the, the like life becomes unbearably painful until death for a lot of cases of of certain illnesses and whatnot and it's like the medical profession's uh view on those things and approach is is fucked like a lot of the time it just kind of ex- extends pain instead of uh you know based on this like just kind of like constant well, belief I think that there's be... always a cure around the corner or yes. whatever which is the real like that's the that seemed that's one of the real takeaways was just like this idea like no we need to drag out someone's life uh who is dying uh because there's there's not a way to conclusively say that a cure won't just like happen at well some and point. and and that's like the one of the big tragedies of this book towards the end where he's he's vacillating between what you're talking about suicide and still sort of clinging desperately to this hope that there's this magical vaccine or treatment that's going to come out right. that that he's going to get access to and 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 save his life so it's like i think that's a that's a really helpful comparison for sure well one thing i wanted to bring up too in that regard is it, there's some uh passages talking about the medical people in the book that are they're just kind of sugarcoating the diagnosis and they they know his fate or people's fate that have the disease but they don't want to they don't want to say it out outright and that's like a a common thing i mean to go back to the great topic of my mom's death um when my mom went back into the icu and she was there for probably like two or three more weeks before she died I didn't realize till like weeks later that like every one of the medical staff like knew her fate. It was just in retrospect, thinking about the interactions and what the nurses were saying and all that shit that no one wanted, no, one, that's like part of the thing. People don't want to say it. Like, even if everyone that is working on your dying relative knows it, they're, they're not like going to sit down and be like, listen, you're going to die. It's you know, right. that's like not what they, that's just not what they do. They don't tell the loved ones that either. It's just kind of like we're gonna keep working on you until it happens. And, yeah, it's, uh, and that's that's best practices. You know, that's that's uh, that's the recommended course of action. Right. And I yeah. think, Matt, this gets back to like what you were saying earlier. This point about like kind of the comfort of the like just purely professional like detached (laughs) attitude of it all right because i think when you start talking about stuff like assisted suicide or any of these like really difficult topics all of a sudden these people who are completely detached in every other way get get very moralistic very fast right Right. they start talking about oh my god you know it's like you just the hippocratic oath you forgot my name yesterday and like almost prescribed me the wrong medication and (laughs) now you're all obsessed with the hippocratic oath about do no harm so yeah, you, there's, a, there's, a, right. there's a sort of dogma at, at the root of it, right? I kind of like, if you cross this line, everything collapses. Yeah. And it's, it's made extra interesting by, in this book, by like, I mean, b- the complicating factor of, of, of it being something people don't understand. And so there really yeah. is this like, plausible deniability that someone is 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 going to die right like you you, there's some part of you if you're maybe a medical professional (laughs) in this time i mean whatever but like of like i i just don't know what the fuck this is like i i can't tell you to your face like you're dead right you know uh not to a degree that's gonna that i'm gonna feel comfortable with and so you you get like these charlatans like bill who are who are straight up lying about the like progress and and effectiveness of of a particular treatment but you're getting the other side which is like we're early you know aids is going to really start ravaging people around the late 80s and you get an account of like the early 80s when it's starting to again the latency period and all this stuff it's very whispers right and uh so yeah i don't know and it again to 
just because not not just to make it a topical issue, but like the COVID thing, the COVID connection. It, uh, <laughs> fuck me. It sounds like a conspiracy documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is like I, I do remember like early on, right? The response was is I think we can all agree this response was bad. And uh, the nature of the sickness itself kept changing in in sort of uh, media accounts. And uh, yeah, I, I, I was talking to my girlfriend about this rec- earlier today, actually. Like, I don't think people have had to, like, just have this constant memento mori over them. Right. For, for this long, especially like an American population specifically. Oh, yeah. You know, this book is French, but just like to have to just sit and meditate on illness (laughs) for any length of time. That's more than five seconds. And now we've had like a year plus coming. Yeah. And I think, I think this, I I genuinely think that it's reading this book in this time is really like, again, it fucking hits different because Mm -hmm. we've had that. We've had that experience of this kind of like sort of false, sort of real hope of a vaccine and, you know, however botched the response was it, it, initially it is also sort of to get to the other point we were kind of talking about kind of miraculous that we have any kind of a vaccine at all in such a short time period like that yeah. is genuinely kind of nuts i you know i haven't gotten mine yet but 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 like that it exists is kind of crazy and just like you said just having to reckon with this thing on a on a mass level i mean i was watching my wife was watching today um the the last season of keeping up with the kardashians that just got released <laughs> right Late, now thread that needle thread the needle i'm going to and um <laughs> it's about it's you know starts out and and in the show it's sort of a reliving of those early days of covid because that's when it was filmed and mm. you see them being like oh yeah we were gonna go to paris for this fashion show or whatever but there's this talk of this weird new virus and we're not sure And I almost was like, I can't watch this. I can't, it's like, it's like traumatic. Like I didn't want to go back there when we were like, so, you know, naive and had no idea what was happening. And like, they're all like, they're all like hugging each other and like in the same room and just being like, wash your hands. Ha ha ha. And I'm like, how fucking stupid were we, you know? And, and it, it, you know, I, so I do think that reading this book in this time is, is, um, adds a layer it adds a layer i'll say that i'll just put it that way yeah i would want to know like uh when the hiv virus was like first like prominently like this is actually in culture and by the time like uh not a cure but by the time like actual progress was being made probably in like was it like the early 90s Um, but i would like to know how many people died before that action happened yeah um just because i I think there's obviously an there's obviously an element of like this of like the homophobic element is like this is not a disease for the majority of the population like this is only affecting um this is a moral come up so so yeah and i think um that kind of thinking especially during those times definitely translated to like the call to action to try to fight it, um, it which is it, obviously morally fucked up. It had to have been, it probably, it not had to have been, but like, I don't know. Again, I think we're all sort of working with limited data on this, but like, yeah. I, I know, you know, I, I think of Reagan when I think of the person, the figurehead of the time of AIDS, uh, and so, therefore, I think of his wife, and I think of Rock Hudson, and I think of probably like the early '80s, uh, mid '80s. Um, well, and it was, and it was all sort of wrapped up in like moral moral majority discourse, and you know, but that's what I mean. Metal music, yeah, right, right, because she was very vocal about that bullshit, and you know, there was this whole thing with with Hudson where it's like uh, we just don't think, you know, it was it was optics. It was like. We, we we don't we don't think we should um pull any strings for you particularly because we don't want to get involved in that, uh and they and they framed it as as like uh, a special favors kind of thing, but you know, you know, 
it's like we're not trying to help help y'all <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. mid 80s maybe was when it was like like mainstream if that's yeah. not too fucked up a way to describe it like i i, I was just looking and the, the the what we now call sort of retroactively the first case was in 1981 it was a guy from san francisco who went to the cdc with some like rare you know like rare condition and obviously they didn't know it at the time they didn't have a name for it at the time but looking back that they, they they now say it was he was the first diagnosed case of, of of hiv i think it was yeah i think that doctor his name was jonathan aids and he was the one that discovered it it's named after him, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, damn yeah, it. i'll i'll take it though i'll allow it i'll allow it we gotta it's like I wish that was the most ah, tame damn. That was the most tame AIDS joke I could think of, right? No, that was good. That was, yeah, I'll allow it. Um, I had another Nothing passage I wanted to read about it. Bill. Sure. It's, uh, I think it's a good sort of, it's about Bill, but it's also about Guibert himself. And again, sort of this like fatalist, like fuck it attitude. So anyway, this is on 2.13. He says, driving me home in his Jaguar on the evening of January 28th, Bill made two edifying remarks. Quote, the Americans, they're big on proof. So they do endless experiments all over the place while everywhere people are dropping like flies, end quote. And quote, in any case, you couldn't have coped with growing old. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I'd like Bill to knock Mockney. Mockney is the, the vaccine guy who, or the you know treatment guy who's developing this treatment. But I'd like Bill to knock Mockney out cold so he can steal his vaccine and bring it to me in the cooler of his little plane the one he used to shuttle between Wooga Dugu and Bobo Dialasso. And I'd like him to crash the plane and the vaccine that he would, that would have saved me into the Atlantic ocean. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, again, it's just, it's so like petty and dark and personal and also just about his own sort of attitude to the whole thing. Like, yeah, bring it, bring it to me, bring me the vaccine, but fucking crash it into the ocean. I don't even give a shit. Right. And then destroy it. I, I, uh, I just wanted to bring up this other thing. There's just this weird extended bit about Thomas Bernhard, uh, who is, for yeah. whatever reason, uh, a writer that Guibert, as a writer, regards as some sort of like weird, uh, dark version of himself, like some sort of like, like figure that he's fighting that he hates, but reluctantly has to call a genius. And I, Dark Link, it, Water Temple. That's right. Yeah, Dark Link. Uh, which is, I found it interesting just because, like, it's, it's, you know, the disease is being dealt with artistically. Uh, and this figure suddenly, this, this writer gets suddenly this weird shout out where he kind of has this, like, moment of, of he kind of spazzes. And he does, like, a, a, a tirade against Bernhardt in, like, I think the style of Bernhardt uh, 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 after reading the book Perturbation. And like, well, I want to read his tirade, but first of all, I just, I'm just curious what you guys think about like, he's lit, Bernhard is literally described as the literary version of AIDS in his blood <laughs> and I'm like, Yes. That's, he that's heavy. What is, why do you think he's, he's going that hard? It's, it, that I mean, I'll, I'll just say I, it's hard for me to, to analyze because I've actually never read any Bernhard um so i know who he is and i have a couple of his books i've just never read any of them um so it's hard for me to like really get a grip on on why he singles him out specifically for this for, like you said for this uh comparison but yeah he uh, i don't know i don't know what he was what he was going for but i mean i do think it fits in with the sort of overall framing of the dis of of the the book as the both the process of dealing with AIDS and the process of dealing with trying to write another book, you know, so it's like it's about dealing with this disease and also dealing with sort of artistic creation. Uh, again, going back to that last chapter where the first line is my book is closing in on me. Right. And it, it so it seems appropriate that another literary figure enters into that conversation. I, I can't say much about specifically why it's Bernhard. 
Well, he comes fucking crashing in. And I, I just find it interesting yes. because, like, it's the only kind of, like, influence anxiety you see uh, in an otherwise, uh, you know, just sort of meditation on, on the illness. So I just wanted to read this. Uh, it's a little long, but I think I can, I can go my way through it. So he says, I hated this Thomas Bernhard. He was undeniably a much better writer than I was, and yet he was only a superficial scribbler, a dabbler, a chop logic filling up space, a purveyor of syllogistic truisms, a tubercular innocent, a waffling tergiversator, a diatri babbler, a splitter of Salzburgian hairs, a blowhard who did everything better than everyone else, biking, writing books, hammering nails, playing the violin, singing, philosophizing, and hating nonstop a misshapen bear ravaged by nervous tics from always swiping at the same targets with his paw, with his big, heavy, stubborn Dutch bumpkin's paw at the same, uh, at the same imaginary targets, his native land and its patriots, the Nazis, the socialists, nuns, theater people, all other writers, and especially good ones, like the literary critics who despised or fulsomely praised his books. Yes, a poor Don Quixote, full of himself, this lousy Viennese traitor to everything who endlessly proclaimed his genius all through his books, which were just little tiny things, little bitty ideas, itsy bitsy gripes, and eeny weeny images, eensy weensy inabilities over which this amateur diddled and dawdled for 200 pages without bulging an inch from the fragment he decided to polish in his incomparable way until it gleamed like the sun or was totally eclipsed by the static on his lines, driving the reader out of his skull with his repetitions, his obsessive marching in place, twanging the reader's nerves. This is all one sentence. Uh, twanging the reader's nerves with little touches as exasperating as skips on a record until these miniature scenes, a child practicing a violin in the shoe closet or of an orphanage during the war, these miniature finds of writing his essay on Mandelson or Bartholdi, swollen tight by the beauty of this writing, uh, I had to admit it at some point or other during this dry diatribe, became complete worlds unto themselves, perfect cosmogenies, while I, for my part, had imprudently challenged Grandmaster Thomas Bernhardt to a blistering game of Blitzkrieg. That's a single sentence. I, I, which, is, which is interesting because it's, because it doesn't Bernhardt write some yes, in like that, that same style, like in little long sort of single sentence fragments? Yes, yeah. Just constant, uh, uh, Oxford comma, I think that's what it is. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, just an outburst that doesn't isn't big in the big grand scheme of things, but just like loomed large to me. I was it's like, notable yeah. because it's so different than everything else in the book. It, it yeah. you're, you're right that yeah. it really does come out of nowhere. And I don't know, and I, I think it has something to do with like Bernhardt's obsessiveness, which I think was like more and more becoming he bears obsessiveness mm -hmm. and therefore there's like a resonance there with him as as the writer like aesthetically doing something that he found himself more and more becoming like his day-to-day -day. and they were both super hot <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what it comes down to just sheer jealousy cosmogony <laughs> yeah I, I i i that's one of the lingering mysteries of the book for me is why why Bernhard? Why include that section? It's 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 funny and it's well written and it's so interesting. But it's like, what what is this doing here? It felt like just another attempt at uh, uh, maybe like just a kind of ruthless honesty about yeah. his inner state that just happened to be at that moment about another literary figure as opposed to disease. And he was tying it in with the disease in some weird way that felt a little hand fisted almost. Um, when was that? What page was that on? Um, let me see. I have the Kindle edition. Because uh, I, for, I for did what find that. Is it? Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. Fuck, I fucking lost it because it. God damn it. My, my if guess you just is search later, for a burn right? I'm sure it'll show up. Control F it. Yeah, control F that <laughs> motherfucker. Uh, it's 196. Yeah, I was gonna say, chapter I thought, 73. I thought I thought it was later in the book. I, I, I did sense that he got a little more embittered as the book went on for sure. Oh yeah. He was a lot more a lot more gripes. Um he has that falling out with uh his actress friend. Yep. Um which is more towards like the middle of the book, but still it was like starting to seep in this kind of like vindictive side of him 
was definitely coming out in large ways and yeah i don't i don't know i didn't i don't know who bernhardt is like i said i've only read like 60 books so uh <laughs> that <laughs> that uh kind of went over my head i was like what is what is this part of the book i don't really understand it um so i don't have much to say about it but all these people are mad young too like marine was like fucking mid-20s like yep. these yep. people were also children essentially like you know bernhard or not bernhard goddamn uh Guibert, uh i think he was 38 when he died yeah uh, he was in his mid mid to late 30s i think but there are portions of this book where he's already cognizant of something wrong and he's just turned 30 yep, yep. so i don't know Th- these people are young a lot of the time too which gets a little lost in the shuffle. Wait, sad, sad. sad. Oh no! Oh, <laughs> yeah, he. God. I think he was thirty-six. Actually, if I'm doing the math right, when he died. When he died. Yeah, when he died. Time to look that up. Nineteen fifty-five to nineteen ninety-one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is Patreon. <laughs> Patreon content only. Watch us do math problems. <laughs> Watch us do math. <laughs> <laughs> openly sweat here we go uh 10 minus 17 <laughs> <laughs> negative seven yes yeah let's yeah. go let's go yeah let's fucking go dude 20 oh, percent oh, of 15 one of the that other one of the other things just if we're thinking about other things that stuck out to us that 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 didn't quite feel right in some way I'm thinking about the second to last chapter where he tells this fucking story about Bill in the driving home from the airport in Miami. And he sees this like feral child run across the street and like take, do you remember this, Matt? Yeah. It's, it's like the second to last little bit of it's the second to last, you know, chapter. Yeah. And then he, is it fictional? Is it, is it, is it, a dream thing it, so i mean I, I probably could just read the whole thing um but essentially bill it's just sort of an out of because bill's sort of out of this story at this point he's yeah. you know he's kind of reneged on his promise to get we bear this treatment um and we bear has kind of made his peace with that in a way and bill is not not made his peace that's an overstatement because he ends the book with fuck you bill but <laughs> right. um but you know bill's not a big factor in the story by this point and then there's this chapter dropped in there at the end that's all about bill and him finding this dirty person running across the road in miami and like bringing them back to his house and then the person keeps trying to come back in once he like feeds them and lets them go. And then he gets a phone call from someone about who calls himself the monkey handler and says that Bill has a weakness for little monkeys. And mm-hmm. he has like a, it's like, it's like, it's like child sex trafficking and like turning them into, it's so, it's such a bizarre little anecdote to drop in as the second to last chapter. It feels like some sort of I, fictional summation of of like the general shit that Bill does, and and definitely just an insult. Is Bill just Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah, yeah Bill Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I I read it as like the most fictionalized part of the book, I, but I also kind of read it as like maybe he's kind of Gubert's starting to lose his mind a little bit. Like he talks about having lesions on his brain mm. um maybe he just got to that stage where he's maybe seeing seeing things or having some sort of paranoia driven from the disease in some way um it's that's how i know it. it's tough to know if he's like uh impossible to know well it's just like is he is he uh losing touch at this point um which would make sense because that's what happened to Foucault at the beginning of the book. Or mm-hmm. is he, but you know, he's a writer and is, or is he fabricating that sense? Right. That, like this is the end of the book, like time to be weird and imagistic and uh, you know, and, and cause you know, like we said, he didn't just write and then I, and I, and then I died. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
But or you do F in the chat for me. You know, it's like it's like uh, in Monty Python, the Holy Grail, when the guy writes, and then I uh, on the wall. <laughs> it's like it's like is he in some way doing a version of that? Like yes. And now I'm I'm going a little crazy, but I I think you just meant with Bill like it was it was kind of like a, a, a like a parable or whatever to encapsulate Bill's behavior. Just Bill being a dirtbag just bill being a piece of shit and then like eventually just being like here's all your like lab animals mm. you know mm. he's so that, that that was my take on it yeah i think that makes sense the the i didn't make that connection the lab animal it's kind of like monkey monkey thing and the last sentence yeah. disturbed me greatly of this book it oh just, read it read, read the whole read the last chapter chapter i'll read yeah, i'll read the last here's the last chapter quote unquote my book is closing in on me. I'm in deep shit. Just how deep do you want me to sink? Fuck you, Bill. My muscles have melted away, and at last my arms and legs are once again as slender as they were when I was a child. Just oh, like... God. Blah, 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 blah. I, yeah. <laughs> it's an icky way to think about life. Like you want to be a skinny child again. Uh, yuck. He's just going back to that state. I mean, they call old age second childhood. You know, yep. it's, it's reversion. Think, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I did find the uh, the passage where um, Gubert and Jules are having sex. Oh, I want to yeah, read, read it. Right. For all our coomers out there, let's read this one. <laughs> oh, oh, do you have any children in the car? Um, throw them out the window. <laughs> throw them out the window. Um, when he got back from the eye doctor, Jules told me that it wasn't conjunctivitis yet, but a white film on the cornea, and that this must be one of the signs of AIDS, so he was afraid he was going to go blind. Well, I was completely freaked by his panic, unable to calm him down, and ready to fall apart right there. I went after his nipples again, and he knelt quickly, automatically in front of me, his hands tied in imagination behind his back, so that he could rub his lips against my crotch, begging me with his grunts and groans to give him my body once again as deliverance from the pain I was inflicting on him. Writing this today so far away from him makes my penis grow hard again after weeks of lifelessness. This attempt at fucking struck me right away as unspeakably sad. I felt as though Jules and I had gotten lost between our lives and our deaths, that this no man's land, ordinarily and necessarily rather nebulous, had suddenly become atro atrociously clear that we were taking our places through the physical coupling in a macabre tableau of two subtle sodomiacal skeletons which is fucking awesome that's a great line <laughs> ja ja jammed all the way up my ass deep in the flash around flesh around my pelvic arch jules made me come as he gazed into my eyes it was an unbearable look too sublime too wrenching both et eternal and threatened by eternity i caught the sob in my throat by making it sound like a sigh of relief oh worst sex ever <laughs> <laughs> but also <laughs> nicely written like oh uh, yeah someone someone tell murakami to read this sex scene right yeah <laughs> evan dara <laughs> or evan dara, yeah, evan, evan dara last dara week <laughs> <laughs> oh god yeah yeah right but that, 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 that was that, strikingly that sums, sad but beautifully written completely but and it also sums up like again you know this conflation of these things uh when when your time frame because there's also the description of like I'm, I'm gonna botch it but just whatever like when you're give like time becoming a tangible entity mm -hmm. like the the that rapid crunch of all things into a simultaneous moment right is yes. is part of the sort of phenomenological blah, 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 uh what experience of 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 illness in general yeah especially when you're given a time frame it's just like things just accordion crunch and are kind of happening all at once and, and and i would say specifically the that that line right at the end the the transmutation of kept like this turning the sob in your throat into a sigh of relief like that is also to me sums up this book's attitude toward death like so well 
And the mm-hmm. fact that it's embedded in a, such a graphic sex scene, that's it. Like that's this book in a nutshell to me, is that line, like turning the sob into a sigh of relief in the context of that scene. Yes, but I would yeah. just, in a more cynical note, because that sounds like some sort of relief in general, I don't think there's any relief in this book. No, no. <laughs> it, yeah, it felt like, it, like, like, well, because it's also, even in that scene, it's done for the sake of someone else. You're trying to let it's them performative know. performative like, It's performative, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whoosh. Whoosh. Uh, guys got it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, do, we, do we want to go there yet? Yeah? You have AIDS, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> That's Hagrid delivering the go. news. There yeah. <laughs> yes, it had to happen. It had to happen. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're seropositive, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Voldemort gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know uh, if I could do that. It, like Gibert, that's the character. Do we yeah, do it or, or what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we could. <laughs> I guess we could talk about Bill or uh, Muzil. I don't know. We could talk about the. Uh, I keep forgetting her name, but the the actress woman, Marine or Marine, Marine, Marine. Musil is weird. She, I mean, we, the the, the pr- preface said maybe it's Robert Musil who's the man without qualities mm-hmm. reference or whatever. But Musil is weird because it's Foucault. It's just Foucault. It's, so yeah, like, yeah, just like what is Foucault's Harry Potter house? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's an interesting question. It is interesting, actually. So just just for context for the listeners, this is the segment that we do at the end of every episode called "We Literally Just Read Another Book," where we get to uh, indulge ourselves and put all the characters from the book we just read into Harry Potter houses. And in fact, how grossly incongruous this is with the content we've been discussing. It's so bad. It makes it much better. <laughs> it's real bad. It's an even it's, better these are also These are also just real people, too. It's like, it's a little icky, but... <laughs> no, fuck it. That's, this is, this is, shows the grotesquery I think this, Foucault which is important. Is, I think Foucault slash Muzil is a Gryffindor. Oh, yeah, me too. Foucault is just an absolute Chad in real life mm-hmm. and is basically a Chad in the book. If, if his death is, even though his death is sort of presented in, in its, in its kind of like ignoble realities, the way he actually kind of went out, the dude was a Chad. Yeah. Yeah. Total Gryffindor Chad. Um, Guibert, I would say, I want to put him in Slytherin. Ravenclaw? I don't know why exactly. I don't, okay, I don't know. I'm going Ravenclaw, wanna, personally. My first instinct is Ravenclaw because his, his like, method of, of coping or, or thinking about what's happening is art and expression and, like, trying to get to the root of it. You know what I mean? Right. Just uh, so cerebral and, like, yeah. uh, like very... You know, if, if if writing is some sort of categorizable form of data, <laughs> like like that, that's partially what feels like it's an attempt. Like, please put me in some sort of literary category that you that will be taxon taxonomizable or whatever later. Right. What do you think? That that feels Slytherinish though to me a little bit. Like I want to be remembered at the expense of stories about my friends. I think there's a few passages where he talks about how Foucault like didn't want anyone to really know about these parts of his life and his illness. And I think, and I think Hubert, Foucault Hubert just like writes Muzo, about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in the book, Musa wanted literally all of his remaining manuscripts and shit, like full on destroyed. Yeah. yeah it's a Kafka situation kind of. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that there's a little bit of selfishness in Hubert choosing to, write about his friends especially Foucault in this in this in this way that it it there's a little bit of like uh an, ambitiousness to him yeah yeah, in yeah that's exploiting that is in exploiting true. his his friend's stories so. and in real life he this book made him very famous 
Yes. And for he, a short he period wrote, when he was for a short period, but when he was still alive before he died. <laughs> I could just I could see him with the Death Eater tattoo on his arm. That's all. That's, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, he does love death. Like, okay, dude, it, you're 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 does. kind of selling me. Yeah. <laughs> Death is kind of an erotic companion the entire time. Uh, there's Slurins also just, can be honest and artistic too. We, yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah, and like you know what? I'm changing. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm with it. You sold me, Paul. Yes. Slytherin. He also was called ten a points spy to Paul by some of his friends. Yeah, just straight up a spy. Yeah. They're like, it kind of disturbs me that you retained all those. <laughs> like specifics about how, what i said to you like a year ago and wrote yes. it down. You know, like that kind of fucks me up and that right. that is yeah it's kind are of like you, are uh, you changing like matter gossip or, girl or... i'm yeah of course yeah i'm, I'm with y'all sick dude paul you just like, go- owned nice. that Disgu- you owned it paul swayze 20 of... points <laughs> 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 paul swayze <laughs> yeah sure uh, um what, <laughs> sure how do you guys feel about how do you guys feel about bill Slytherin. Bill's a Slytherin. He's a Slytherin. <laughs> if yeah, we don't he's, even, like he's the most caricature, worst yeah. Slytherin. Yeah. Just parcel tongue, just being like Draco I can, Malfoy. Yeah. Just like if I can have sex with you, you I, don't have AIDS. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the AIDS treatment. <laughs> Oh my god. That's that's getting us canceled. Yeah. If there's anything that's gonna infuriate people, it's that. <laughs> AIDS AIDS parcel tongue is just officially canceled. AIDS parcel tongue. Yeah, Sarah Parcel Tongue. God damn it, dude. Okay. Um that's all yeah, I, yeah. I those are I'm, the big ones. Like maybe we could talk about Jules. Jules feels like a little bit of a Hufflepuff to me. Yeah. He's just a put a good face on it kind of like but he's you know, like very just nervous he's rep- underneath. he's just repressing yeah a yeah. lot of stuff um yeah i i do i do think we could talk about marianne the, the actress i think she's a slytherin too. definitely a slytherin she's yeah. all about she herself didn't... she just bails when she's like all these people like whenever you get an account of fucking celebrity especially all these young people and stuff it's like so you know, I, I thought of Edie Sedgwick and shit. Like, yeah, like, just be just twenty year olds that are like about to have absolute nervous breakdowns. Yeah, it's just like it's just like <laughs> it's just constantly these people that are like being just mentally and physically abused. They're just like on drugs constantly and like fucking around and just like they're just always just like mentally just it's so threadbare. By the time not a recipe like, for success. No, I always get no. so stressed out reading. You know forget even the aids element which just completely is catastrophic it's like yeah these fucking people lead lives that would just demolish me mentally yes sam yeah she was just she was just getting abused on stage literally by her co-star right yeah. oh man that yeah. was that was a bizarre like but that's what i mean marine was 25 in the that te- in that time period which is just like a nice little bit of perspective there it's like damn that was a dark situation where he's just describing like the the guy that her co-star actor taking advantage of like right. a physical scene to like actually fit abuse her on stage <laughs> in front so of much. people. Like, yeah, he's like, no, I need to do a, a, I need to like do a Cold Stone stunner on you or whatever because <laughs> of because of, of realism. He just calls it the jabroni. <laughs> I have to suplex you through a table. Exactly. We want the audience to buy it. <laughs> Jesus. Um I need, to crack, yeah. I need to crack your spine like a WWE Ooh. wrestler. Ooh. Nice. Brand uh native advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's called? No, I don't know. What uh, uh score? Is it score time? Let's do it. Yeah, final thoughts and I, I've got to go last, I think, right? So yes. I'll go first. Uh I really like this book. It was really fucking good i really there's not much i didn't like about it um it's what i like in a story you know even though it's there's a lot of truthful elements to it but <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool it with that cool it's, it's, cool it's it coming that. it's coming fast and furious now yeah we gotta yeah. get off here yeah, yeah. Sorry. i was too serious um, for too long right 
but I, I you know I have a fascination with the macabre uh, and it hit my it tickled my funny bones my dark bones yes um, okay oh. okay what dark bones <laughs> let's just get through it you sound let's like a Thanksgiving right. turkey I, yeah I I, the there's not much I didn't like about it I really liked his writing a lot I thought it was beautiful evocative um, touching I think I'm gonna give it a four point through two five. Nice. That's a nice clean score. Yeah. Four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. Four and a quarter. <laughs> uh quarter. All right. Uh I also very much like this book. Um I am a bit I guess susceptible to I, I've read a couple, not AIDS, obviously, specifically, but like I've just read other sort of um, how to describe it, like unflinching accounts of illness, mm. like in a sort of weird, feverish, autobiographical mode where, uh, you know, uh, I, I read Journey Around My Skull, I think was the last thing I read. Uh, pretty good. Um, very different illness and topic but like whatever this stuff affects me emotionally pretty intensely um i don't know very positive but in my version in grumpy matt's version which means it's a a 3.5 for me 3.50 yeah i uh, relate to your that relates to your your nazi love nazis how's that how's that i'm just kidding that's fine yeah that's right I, I also I fucking came out chest out at you and made you back <laughs> down. I'm just afraid that you might like turn SS on me right now and come over to my house and kill me. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Whoa. <laughs> so uh I also have a have an affinity for affecting narratives of disease. I loved the film Inside Out by Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> You can be sad and happy at the same time. <laughs> and it's not bad. Yeah. Um, I think I'm actually kind of somewhere in between you guys. I, I was, I originally, I, I went back and forth with this book a little bit because I was uh, like, like Matt, deeply emotionally affected, but like also in some ways, like literally not super into it in pre- like with the writing itself. But then I reread some chunks and I, it, it fit together in a way for me that, that wound up working. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm at like a 3.65. Same, like, you know, three, yeah. like mid mid to high threes. Definitely rounding up to four on the Goodreads. So in that in that zone, for sure. And I, I just I think, think if you if you rate this below a four, you're discriminating. <laughs> I know. I know. Damn it. <laughs> I, it's a it's, it's a seven. It's a six bagger. It's six out of five <laughs> on Goodreads. Uh, I think I give it a, I give it eight out of eight bags and one condom. <laughs> Please, for the Damn love it. of God, one condom. We have to end this episode like now. Yeah, we do. Fuck. What were you gonna yeah, say, Matt? Sorry. No, just uh, I mean, again, coming from not having read a lot about you know this this whole disease and it spread in, in in literary forms and stuff like i i think this was i think it was a big deal like yeah i don't know I, I, as far as like a demographic sort of representative that could hear about this shit that this felt like a good i don't know a good way to to engage with it or read this fucking book for sure a document worth reading yeah read this book no question yes yeah good covid book good covid book definitely that adds a fucking that's mm-hmm. a, that's a thing for me beach read <clears throat> uh beach read uh <laughs> in covid covid beach read yeah and uh practice safe, safe sex everybody yeah <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> be careful out there be careful out there covid and sex things and with that, we leave you. We love you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye. Oh, hold on. Bye, One second. Everybody. One second. Wait, I don't no. know what it's going to look like by the time this episode comes out, but we do have a Patreon. 
now. That's real. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there we accept it's, currency it's, only. It's very uh, yeah, it's skeletal, but. What's it called? If, if you give us money, yeah. bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay, we didn't go by. Okay, now we can say bye. Or unless anyone wants to say anything. No, dude, fucking end it. What the fuck?